get started. So welcome everybody uh, to today's uh, book discussion of the recently published book, Vietnam, Navigating a Rapidly Changing Economy, Society and Political Order. My name is Tony Seish. I'm the director of the Roger Wiley Foundation Institute for Asia, but I need to start with a few uh, announcements before I hand over to our moderator today. The Roger Wiley Foundation Institute for Asia acknowledges the land on which Harvard University sits is a traditional territory of the Massachusetts people. We also recognize the continuing presence of the neighboring Wampanoag and Nipomak uh, nations. Uh, it's important to note that today's discussion is being recorded. You will receive a link to that recording in an email, in an email following the conclusion of the event, but you'll also be able to find it on the Ash Center's YouTube uh, channel. So our panelists are gonna do their very best to save some time for questions at the end of the discussion. We have some questions already, others may be submitted anytime via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Finally, I would like to thank Harvard University Asia Center for co-sponsoring today's event. Our moderator today is also one of the co-editors of the book. Dwight Perkins is the H.H. Burbank Professor of Political Economy Emeritus here at Harvard University. He's the author, co-author, editor of numerous books, some 26 books, over 100 articles. Much of that work has focused on developments in East and Southeast Asia, uh, their economic history and development. Dwight has been the director of the Harvard Institute for International Development. He's chaired the economics department and has directed uh, the Harvard Asia Center. His work with Vietnam began in 1989 when he was consulting with the government of Vietnam about various issues related to their economic reform. He's also been very heavily involved and was in one of the instigators of the Fulbright Economic Training Program in Ho Chi Minh City, which is now part of the Fulbright University of Vietnam. With that, I will hand it over to you, Dwight. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh... That's a more elaborate introduction than I expected. Unfortunately, I won't be able to do that for the others. Uh, what we're going to try to do this morning is give you a, a sense of what the, the this new book, uh, uh, Vietnam Navigating Rapidly Changing Economy, Society, and Political Order, is about. But given that we had 23 authors and co-authors of the 17 chapters, it's impossible to do that in any systematic way in the time we have. It would take all day or longer. Um, and so instead, what we've done is we've asked um, four people from the four principal sections of the book, the political section, which has five chapters, the economic section of the five, the social sector with four chapters, and then the foreign policy with with three, we've asked one person from each of those to uh, to talk a bit about an aspect uh, that they cover uh, in, in their chapter. Uh, the idea for the, the original idea for this book uh, was from uh, Borea Jungren, uh, the who, as many of you know, was ambassador to Vietnam and then later to China if, uh, before retiring from a career with the Swedish International Development Agency and, uh, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Borier had spent a year at Harvard uh, now more, more than 30 years ago and had done a book on Vietnam and in fact, more broadly on the Indochina area um, and had edited that and a number of us had participated in it. And he thought it was time for a, a new volume that would deal with, not with Vietnam during the war, or the immediate aftermath of the war, but Vietnam since the really reform era began 
either in 1986, if you're thinking about political reform, or 1989 in terms of more economic reforms, dealing with uh, Vietnam during that, that period, and particularly the um, both the period up to the present and then to some degree speculation about the, about the future. Uh, I agree. He asked me to join him in that effort. I I agreed, and then it, we then set out. And over time, we got to put together a group of people, uh, some twenty three in all, as I said, uh, to to write the individual chapters. It became a not a collective effort of two people, but a collective effort, really, of 20, uh, 23 people. The format that we followed. And we originally thought we could do this in a couple of years. It actually took better part of five years uh, from the beginning to the end. Uh, uh, we had a our opening uh, 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 workshop uh, in Stockholm uh, in nineteen in twenty nineteen. That was ably managed by Ava Hansen a senior lecturer at Stockholm University and the coordinator of the Stockholm Center for Global Asia at Stockholm University. And she became a key part of the management of this, this, this whole effort. The success of that and the discussions that we had led on to another workshop in Ho Chi Minh City. Organized by Wu Tang Tuang, the then dean of the Fulbright Public Policy School, uh, it's now part of the Fulbright University of Vietnam. And then we originally planned to have a third uh, workshop, the final one, to wrap everything up uh, at Harvard. But the pandemic came along, and so we had instead a series uh, of Zoom meetings. That led on to eventually to the submission of the volume to the Harvard Asia Center Press, the process there, and then finally uh, in the this summer, the actual publication of the book, which is also distributed by Harvard University Press and many others like Amazon. Yeah, I, there were many, many people who, who, in addition to the authors, who played a critical role in this effort. And I want to only mention some of the most important. To begin with, uh, the Ash Center and the, uh, led by Tony Sage at the time was absolutely, both Tony himself and his assistant, Mark Shea, were critical. Uh, throughout the project, both in terms of the management of the project and in the funding. The Asia Center, uh, James Robinson, uh, uh, the director, act gave us a grant at the outset, which, which was crucial in also getting us started. Uh, particularly important was a grant from the, uh, well, it was a, a an agreement with the China Medical Board, led by Lincoln Chen at the time, uh, to fund all of the Vietnamese participants uh, in, in this project uh, uh, to come to the various workshops, uh, an expense that would have been very difficult to deal with otherwise. And then we also had, from the beginning, very substantial research for support financial support from the foundation of the Swedish Central Bank. Uh, I will not pronounce its name or slaughter its pronunciation uh, in Swedish, but it was a key uh, uh, funding for, for this effort. In addition, we, there was the support of the Stockholm University Forum and the Fulbright University of Vietnam. Uh, the the four people we have to actually do the presentations today, each one will talk for roughly 12 minutes. Um, and we will go in the order of, 
of the way the book is set up, the political section, the economic section, the social section, and then the foreign policy. We will begin uh, with Borea Jungren. I've already basically mentioned, as you all know, he was a former uh, ambassador to Vietnam and to China and uh, has had a long and very distinguished career, much of it uh, a resident or working with the government in Sweden uh, uh, in, in both the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Swedish International Development Agency. He will speak about Vietnamese politics, and he has written one of the key chapters on that. Nguyen San Tang is a senior lecturer at the Fulbright School of Public Policy and Management. And he is also a member of the Economic Advisory Council of the Prime Minister of Vietnam. Um, he will be talking about the economics and politics involved in Vietnam's large scale private companies and their leaders, uh, often referred to as oligarchs. Sarah Bales is a key author with Lincoln Chun and Lian Lenin Fung and is a visiting professor at. Hanoi University of Public Health, and she's also a long-term member of the China Medical Board team in Hanoi. She will be speaking about Vietnam's public health challenges. But finally, from the uh, among the authors of the book, uh, Bill Hayden is an associate fellow with the Asia Pacific Program at Chatham House in London. He's the author of uh, a good many books on Asia and Vietnam, and he served uh, in 2006-2007 as the British Broadcasting Company reporter uh, in Vietnam. Last but definitely not least, Frederick Logoval will be our discussant. Professor Logoval is a professor of both Harvard's Kennedy School and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. His most recent book is about John F. Kennedy. Uh, uh, he specializes on foreign politics and foreign policy of the U.S. But in, 19, in 2013, he won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, Ambers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam. And he will comment generally about the book and, and, the, and the talks of the others. And then we will hopefully have time to open it up for questions. So I will stop there and turn it over. Uh, Borier, the, the field the, 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 is yours to, to lead off. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, Dwight, not least for the privilege of working with you for the last too many years. It all began in 1990, as you said. And thank you, 23 in all, who have been part of this highly interactive project on contemporary Vietnam, a project with, with solid, I'm happy to say, solid Vietnamese participation. It's urgent to deepen our understanding of contemporary Vietnam. No coincidence that President Biden chose to visit Vietnam, or that Vietnam was one of the two Southeast Asian countries especially invited to the G7 Hiroshima summit in Japan last May. All clear signs of Vietnam's growing importance in the era of China's assertiveness and growing geopolitics. Note that Biden was hosted not by Vietnam's president, but by the party secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam, Nguyen Phu Tong, powerful party leader since more than 10 years and deeply committed to maintaining the party monopoly. Our volume is, as Dwight has emphasized, focusing on development since 86, the year of the launch of Doi Moi, renovations and reform, a journey from poverty and isolation to middle income status and global integration, all while still a party state. Necessary points of departures then are, one, the post era of failed and central planning, the DRV model and deep poverty. Two, the journey from the isolation that Vietnam experienced shortly after, less than four years after the war, when after entering Cambodia in December 78 to remove Pol Pot and expand its influence in the region, followed by China's attack on Vietnam 
in February 79. The US, China, and ASEAN formed a cynical alliance against Vietnam. A difficult decade followed with 10 years of deep frozen Sino-Vietnamese relations. A new beginning was then 86 uh, with Doi Mui and deeper reforms as White was mentioning in 89, economic reforms. When the Soviet empire collapsed, Hanoi felt the chill, but found its way. 1995 was a very crucial year. It was the normalization that year that happened with the US, an agreement with the EU, and not least membership of ASEAN, what the legendary foreign minister in Tak called a bumper crop within a few months in, in 95. Another crucial uh, moment is the entry in 2007 into the WTO. During the last few decades, Vietnam has achieved rapid economic development and dramatically reduced poverty. Less than 10% today live below the poverty line. Vietnam's human development index has kept improving. Global integration has played a major role in all of this with foreign direct investments as a driving force. Today, the volume of Vietnam's foreign trade is twice as large as its nominal GDP, twice as large, only exceeded by countries like Singapore. A crucial dilemma is that the value added from foreign direct investment remains low, mainly consisting of labor, as is the case for Samsung. And this uh, shows that the linkages into the domestic economy remain weak. This is a, and this is a major systemic challenge. The quality of basic education has been an asset. Corruption has been reduced in recent years, but remain widespread and systemic. For party secretary Chung, a party builder, cleaning the party has been a key priority, but not through an independent judiciary and transparency, but rather enhanced controls. The party's four million members should be non-corrupt model citizens, an unreal idea. In short, Vietnam has succeeded in combining its authoritarian political system with the dynamics of global capitalism. And contrary to the predictions of leading scholars, it has simply failed to fail, referring to Asimogler and Robinson's book, Why Nations Fail. It has remained a party state, highly pragmatic in a number of ways, but the mandate is Lenin Leninist, or today rather uh, market Leninism. In our volume, we focus it naturally on the central role of politics, on the party state as such, on Confucianism and Leninism, on constitutionalism and its obvious limits, on civil society, the democracy movement and protests, on the symbiotic relationship between oligarchs and the party, and Suan Tang's original chapter, on the role and, and room for enterprises and what needs to be done. The party state label is often used without definition. In my chapter of the book, I've used a, an empirical definition very much based on my own experiences from serving in three countries with such a system, Laos, Vietnam, and China. A party state is not just a one party state. There are many, but a much more comprehensive construct. In the case of Vietnam rooted in decades of war against the colonialists and Cold War aggression. My, my definition rests on six pillars. One, the political power rests with the party. This is written into the constitution. The party controls the army, armed forces and police through party leadership and a high degree of party membership. The army should, quote, According to the constitution, quote, be absolutely loyal to the party, not only to the country. Number three, the party controls the legislature and the administrative state. Just a few screened independent members of the judiciary. Four, the party controls the judicial system and the domestic security apparatus. Five, the party ensures that civil society is kept within the constraints of the party state. And number six, finally, the party exercises ultimate control over media and the interpretation of history. 
Broadly speaking, Vietnam meets all six criteria above. China exceeds them all by a wide margin. Political reforms have not, been, have not grown as deep over time as many had hoped for, and repression in the name of stability, stability remains a reality. Still, the party has to cope in an increasingly dynamic environment and cannot unilaterally exercise power. The political culture has a deliberative dimension and social media has come to play a significant role. Vietnam is clearly authoritarian, but not totalitarian. What does then the future look like? Vietnam is not about to become a democracy. It may, as Jonathan London says, take another 20 years. The, the directly relevant question is rather whether the party will respond to demands for institutional reforms. In its pragmatic, omnidirectional foreign policy, the Vietnamese government stresses diversification and multilateralization. Alexander Wuving talks about Vietnam's bamboo approach. No military alliances, no siding with any other country against another, no foreign bases, and no use of force. This is a major development. Even though both Vietnam and China are party states, relations are becoming increasingly complex with crucial unresolved territorial issues. Their international trajectories are, as Bill Hayden will discuss, destined to become increasingly different. China entrenched in a global contest, Vietnam enjoying grow growing possibilities. While Sino-US relations are bound to become more rather than less hostile, Vietnamese-American relations are, as Biden's visit shows, growing deeper. And the US will hardly make Vietnamese system change a major issue. For Vietnam, this dynamic context offers both opportunities and challenges. And for sure, a complex balancing act, which Vietnam currently handles quite well. The biggest challenges are domestic. Vietnam's potential is great, but a prerequisite is that Vietnam moves beyond the current nature of the party state. Today, we can witness a widening gap between party and society, a society wanting sustained change. My favorite Vietnamese politician, former Prime Minister Wu Van Kiet, whom I got to know quite well, once urged the Politburo not to be afraid of the future. No one can visit Vietnam without being struck by the resilience, vitality, and energy of its people. Thank you. Should I uh, start my part? Yes, Fantan, you're up next. I would go. Okay. So uh, up next is on the economic section of the book. Uh, uh, um, cover a lot of topics. And uh, my chapter is on the evolution of large domestic businesses and oligarchs in uh, um, Vietnam. And uh, by the time the book uh, was published, uh, we can see the very diverging fortunes of uh, many Vietnamese oligarchs. Uh, on the one hand, you have uh, business uh, men like uh, Mr. Phạm Nhật Vương, who got his uh, VinFast uh, electric vehicle uh, listing on uh, NASDAQ. And on the other hand, you have uh, the arrest of one of the biggest uh, property developer uh, in Vietnam and the subsequent collapse of also one of the largest uh, private banks uh, in uh, Vietnam. And also, uh, interestingly, you can see uh, uh, the rising uh, uh, stars in Vietnam are the olig oligarchs who we can trace their original wealth in Eastern Europe. And a lot of the uh, oligarchs who are in trouble now, we can trace their origin of wealth 
back in the days that Vietnam uh, started uh, uh, đổi mới, uh, leading to many uh, oligarchs uh, taking advantage uh, of uh, Uh, being the first movers in the uh, dynamic uh, market economy of uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh. But for my uh, chapter, uh, I'm looking, searching for the Vietnamese oligarchs, look at their origin of wealth, the evolution uh, of their businesses, and also their recent uh, wealth defense strategy on the face of Vietnam, uh, both uh, becoming more and more integrated with the global economy, but domestically and politically, there's an ongoing anti-corruption campaign uh, targeting many of these uh, uh, oligarchs. So historically, Vietnam, like uh, many other socialist countries, uh, namely the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, Uh, North Korea, basically socialism led to the destruction of uh, rich business people in the country and also the uh, replacement of a market economy with a central uh, planning system. But Vietnam is different from uh, other socialist countries uh, in a sense that uh, the, the adoption of socialism and a central planning system didn't completely destroy the market economy. So uh, with the unification of the country in 1975, uh, political leaders in North Vietnam did try to replace the market economy in South Vietnam with a Leninist style uh, control and command uh, economy. Uh, that effort uh, in the second half of the 70s quickly led to uh, a significant slowdown of economic development and extreme incidence of poverty, uh, forcing uh, uh, communist leaders to quickly abandon the effort to completely centralize uh, the southern economy. So remnants of a market economy still existed in, uh, uh, in Ho Chi Minh uh, City. And uh, by the late 1980s and early 1990s, seeing the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Communist Party decided to open up. And many family-based businesses in Ho Chi Minh City took advantage of that. And that was the origin of the very first uh, Uh, um, rich uh, business people in Vietnam, and by and then uh, by the late 1990s and early 2000s, Vietnam uh, saw the second wave of rich business people coming up, uh, uh, um, uh, coming from uh, Eastern European. Those are in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s, were like the smartest. Uh, young Vietnamese sent uh, by the government of Vietnam to the Soviet Union and other European countries for uh, university and postgraduate uh, studies. And the transition of the Eastern European uh, economies uh, offer opportunities for many of these young Vietnamese uh, upon graduating and even during their study to start their own businesses. Um, uh, and by the late 1990s and early 2000s, they transfer a lot of wealth uh, out of Eastern Europe and back to Vietnam to start uh, uh, their own businesses. And that happened as uh, the, the Communist Party in Vietnam became more confident of their economic reform uh, policies and adopted a, a roadmap Uh, to allow f a formal private sector to exist. And later on, accepting formal private sector as the main engine for economic uh, development in place of uh, state-owned uh, uh, enterprise, uh, uh, enterprises. And that's why, uh, so by uh, the late 2000, uh, 
uh, uh, Forbes began publishing the richest uh, Vietnamese businesses. Uh, uh, so these uh, uh, in the list, you can see the uh, five recognized billionaires in, uh, in Vietnam. And interestingly, uh, uh, most of them uh, got their wealth from either one of two businesses, uh, property development or banking. And most often uh, they uh, are involved in both. And uh, the reason for that is uh, 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 property development and, and, and banking offer a lot of rent seeking opportunities. Uh, and often the combination of real estate and banking led to the development of a complex cross ownership uh, structure. Uh, allowing these uh, business people to accumulate uh, uh, wealth in Vietnam uh, in an unprecedented uh, uh, scale. And, uh, but also if you compare uh, economic reforms in Vietnam and the emergence of uh, rich business people to other uh, transition uh, economies, uh, namely, uh, Russia or, uh, or China. Right? In Vietnam, you don't see uh, oligarchs uh, uh, who are former or current political leaders. And also you don't see oligarchs who are former or current senior executives of, uh, uh, of SOEs. So as I mentioned, uh, up until now, you can basically group these oligarchs in two, uh, two types, right? The, the one who took the first mover uh, advantage when Vietnam started reform. Uh, most of them are based in Ho Chi Minh uh, City. And the second group are those who got their first uh, money in Eastern Europe and managed to successfully transfer their wealth to Vietnam and started formal businesses. And most of them are based in uh, uh, in Hanoi. Right. So uh, the reason that we, we, we don't see oligarchs who are former political leaders or former SOE is the fact that uh, that this, the, the, the party leadership is always concerned uh, with uh, rich people, especially oligarchs with special political connection became too powerful. Uh, and they are afraid that's one of the source of what they call peaceful evolution that led to the destruction of power of the Communist Party. So, so political leaders know that they, they can accumulate wealth, but they cannot be seen as actively controlling big uh, businesses and using their political connections for wealth accumulation. The moment any political leader seems to be doing that, they, they will be uh, destroyed by, by the party apparatus. The same thing uh, happened with uh, executives of, of SOEs. So Vietnam also uh, embarked on, uh, on a lot of efforts to privatize uh, state-owned enterprises. Uh, the name used in Vietnam is not strictly privatization, but we call, um, uh, but uh, uh, in, in any, any case, uh, uh, some of these executive SOEs can reach uh, out of these privatization schemes, but anyone who are seen as uh, accumulate wealth uh, in the form of asset stripping uh, from these SOEs are also quickly destroyed by, uh, uh, by the political system. So, uh, so by the time uh, Viet, uh, Vietnam joined uh, WTO and, and became deeply more integrated with the global uh, economy. Uh, uh, the, the, the policy di uh, direction in, in, uh, in Vietnam is that uh, uh, even though uh, they are reluctant to accept that SOEs uh, uh, cannot be the leading role uh, for economic development in, in Vietnam, but quietly they know that they need a new source of growth and that's the private sector 
led by larger and more formal uh, companies. So, so a lot of uh, legal and policy reforms are geared towards supporting the development of these large businesses and, uh, and oligarchs. And that led to these uh, rich business people be, becoming more bolder in their investments, uh, continued investment in uh, both property uh, projects and in banking businesses, intensifying their complex structure of uh, cross uh, ownerships. And, and by the uh, uh, 2015, uh, the party uh, saw the danger uh, uh, of corruption getting out of control. So they, they, they started a lot of investigations and a lot of that was uh, um, uh, um, gated uh, through party documents led by party secretary uh, General Nguyen, uh, Nguyen Phu Chao. And all of these investigations uh, quickly led to uh, the, the source of wealth uh, used by many of these uh, uh, oligarchs. And they became very uh, vulnerable, uh, making them very active in pursuing different wealth defense uh, uh, strategies. So one, uh, uh, one form of uh, uh, well defend uh, 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 strategies uh, is to basically double that, right? So building up on uh, the existing political uh, connections, putting further money into property development and uh, uh, and banking. Uh, but increasingly, uh, those uh, traditional strategies uh, became more and more risky. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the recent arrests and prosecution uh, linked to uh, corruption investigations uh, happened because of these oligarchs' uh, failure in executing these uh, well defense strategies. Uh, the more successful ones that we, uh, we see uh, is oligarchs inviting the participant of uh, strategic investors. I mean, leveraging on Vietnam's uh, 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 more comprehensive uh, trade and investment agreements uh, and stronger uh, legal uh, pro uh, pro uh, protection. And, and the party will, will see these oligarchs as less of a threat uh, to the political uh, to the political system, and uh, as I mentioned more recently, uh, a lot of them are pursuing strategies to get uh, listed in foreign uh, financial markets, like Vinfast, uh, recent listing in uh, in uh, Nasdaq, and uh, the expectation uh, is that. Uh, uh, soon there will be more uh, large Vietnamese uh, companies pursuing uh, uh, foreign listing. And also, uh, secondly, we see the, the trend of uh, a lot of these uh, businesses uh, advocating the government that they can become the new instruments of industrial policy, replacing the traditional SOEs, which are now seen as very inefficient and in, uh, effective. So basically, uh, that's uh, toward the end of, of, uh, of my uh, chapter that I posed uh, the question that it will remain to be seen, uh, both uh, as uh, uh, whether the remaining uh, uh, rich and influential Vietnamese uh, uh, business people uh, uh, whether they will be successful in pursuing uh, ambitious uh, global uh, expansion and inviting the participation of international uh, strategic investors and whether also they can be uh, successful uh, in re replacing the traditional SOEs as new instruments of uh, uh, the government industrial uh, uh, policy. Right. Uh, so far, it's, uh, it, it proves to be very uh, challenging. A lot of them are under tremendous uh, financial uh, pressure uh, um, at, the moment, uh, at the moment. So, so that's my kind of take.
Thank you. Thank you, thank you Swan, Swan Tang. I should add that the uh, economic section ha also has uh, chapters on the growth since 89 and the uh, and future prospects. It has chapter on the financial system, one on foreign direct investment and foreign trade, and a, another on agricultural development, the Mekong Delta and its environmental uh, consequences. Sarah, uh, it's, it's, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so I don't have slides. I'm just going to be speaking about my chapter um, entitled Navigating Transitions in Protecting People's Health. So in the years before Doi Moli, Vietnam was praised for achieving relatively good health outcomes despite its low GDP per capita. Um, the Doi Moli marketed market-oriented reforms increased resource mobilization for provision of healthcare services. Um, so in a way it was expected that the health would improve and so on. But it also started a transformation of the health sector into a more hospital centric system with a very weak primary healthcare uh, provision and created important challenges to equity and efficiency goals of the system and also to financial sustainability. So if we go back to the pre doi Moi period, the periods of conflict um, with France, with the United States, there were very limited resources. Uh, the Communist Party attempted to provide adequate health care to all as part of its strategy to attract people to the cause of national liberation. Measures implemented were focused on prevention, such as clean water, sanitation, and immunizations. Um, there was heavy reliance on the Soviet Union for medicines and also on readily available natural remedies from Vietnamese traditional medicine. So it was a very strategic move to do the most possible with the very limited resources. The collapse of the Soviet Union, however, pushed Vietnam to have to implement market reforms of Doi Mui, including reforms in the health sector, uh, introducing, introducing the private sector and introducing um, pricing, pricing and user fees. Uh, initially, the grassroots health system remained uh, subsidized by the state, uh, preventing it from collapsing. And there was a lot of donor funding to help support the vertical programs that were still focused on prevention and promotion, nutrition, uh, infectious disease. So in the Doi Moi, uh, reforms, additional resources began to be mobilized to provide health care. Um, the government introduced what they call use, partial user fees, which is basically a partial cost recovery of the cost of providing care that would be collected directly from the patients. Um, this was to supplement the limited government budget subsidies. Um, however, there was an awareness in the party and in the government that this could lead to adverse effects on access to services. So in 1992, the Council of Ministers introduced the social health insurance program for employed workers. Um, unfortunately, they didn't introduce any scheme to support the poor. Instead, they relied on unfunded exemptions from fees for the poor and other vulnerable groups. Uh, but these were very ineffective in, in ensuring financial protection and, and financial access to services. However, the government continued to prioritize this program and over time the social health insurance scheme coverage expanded to include um, the contributory membership for formal sector and civil servants and uh, for the self-employed and the government used government funding to subsidize coverage for children, for the poor, the elderly and other vulnerable or meritorious groups. Um, by 2020 over 90% of the population was covered by the scheme in its efforts to achieve universal health coverage, um, they introduced a concept of universal health insurance coverage. Um, at the same time, the Ministry of Health expanded the health insurance service package. So the lists of drugs, the lists of services that were covered by insurance continued to expand also in the effort to achieve greater um, universal health coverage. Um, however, um, and these measures uh, to some extent were focused on the political goal of reinforcing legitimacy of the party. However, the out-of-pocket payments from households uh, remained high and, and increased over certain periods. Um, we can also say that Doi Moi affected health. As household incomes grew, 
life expectancy increased and the disease burden shifted from the infectious diseases and nutritional disorders towards non-communicable diseases. These are diseases that were not traditionally managed at the grassroots level or in the national health programs funded by the state budget. Um, also, at the same time as the economy grew, there were conflicts between the goals of improving the people's health and the goal of high economic growth through sectors such as um, tobacco industry, um, the beverage industry, the fast food industry, and also in the um, lack of controls over air pollution and other forms of pollution. So the doimoi had help to improve health, but at the same time, it created certain political pressures for uh, factors that would be considered harmful to health. Uh, higher incomes after doimoi also affected people's expectations of the health care that they should receive. As people de people's demand for high quality health care rose, people began uh, bypassing the grassroots level and seeking care at hospitals, specialist providers and retail pharmacies. Um, and so they began skipping over the basic primary health care services that they used to receive under the, um, the older uh, policies. As um, incomes from providing curative care at the provider side added to GDP uh, and the private sector and private investments in high tech services at public hospitals were encouraged, these were considered to increase the quality of health care. Um, but at the same time, they led to increased uh, provision of unnecessary care in a very hospital-centric system. The National Assembly responded to population demands for greater access to higher level facilities and specialist care by eliminating the gatekeeper system that had been in place to help uh, orient people towards seeking primary care first and getting referrals to higher level care. So this contributed even further to the hospital centricity of the system. Um, the market reforms and efforts to reduce the burden of financing health services on the state budget uh, have led to various policies that distort incentives in the system. So the initial introduction of partial user fees never made clear what part was covered by the user fees and what part was supposed to be covered by the subsidies. Um, or the and what part was to be covered by the insurance fund. Um, application of unrealistically low civil servant pay scales to health workers failed to take into account labor market forces and rising income expectations of skilled clinicians. Uh, hospitals were pushed towards greater financial autonomy to be able to collect revenues that would fully pay their costs of providing care. And the idea was to eventually wean hospitals off of state supply side subsidies. Surplus revenues were supposed to be used to top up salaries to retain staff, but the user fees were costed using the low civil servant pay scales, for example, $2 per hour for a surgeon's time when a maid would be paid three, I mean, five, $5 an hour. So very unrealistic uh, costing to determine the prices. So it became more and more difficult for hospitals to gain any surplus and even to pay the basic payroll of their staff. So in these conditions, uh, corruption became almost an inevitable strategy for financial survival. Uh, this included uh, measures such as inflating prices of equipment or drugs to get kickbacks or to be allowed to charge higher than government user fees. Um, and over-provision of expensive services not subject to government price controls or uh, not covered by the health insurance fund. Uh, huge inefficiencies resulted. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, put the health sector in the spotlight, uh, not only putting additional pressure on the system, but also um, because the state was investing a large amount of resources into the COVID-19 fight uh, to keep people safe, but it also led to greater government oversight. This revealed a lot of corruption at all levels, in even leading to the arrest and imprisonment of the Minister of Health and other high-level health sector officials and hospital managers. Besides corruption as a strategy, the party also allowed hospitals to pursue uh, provision of what they call on-demand services, which are basically private services provided in public hospitals. Uh, they could purchase private, um, private, they could mobilize private funding to purchase newer equipment, 
Uh, they could set up VIP wards or special wards, which would have lower waiting times in return for collection of higher user fees, um, nicer hospital rooms, um, and basically privatizing internally the public facilities. Patients were strongly nudged towards using these services uh, for fear of suffering long wait times, harassment by health workers, or even the, the risk that they might be given ineffective care. So this has effectively helped to extract substantial out-of-pocket spending from the better off people in society, but it has also led to reduced access and utilization of many services uh, among the, the poor. So the Doimoi reforms help to introduce um, market reforms and so user fees, mobilize funding, uh, try to implement measures that would uh, achieve greater efficiency and increase the competition with the private sector. Um, this did lead to improvements in access, improvements in the kinds of services available to the population. Um, the goal of universal health care was adopted by the government and the party, so this was clearly a government goal. However, the policy development to manage the sector and ensure that it met the needs of the population in an equitable and efficient way have not kept up with the many forces influencing both patient health care seeking and provider behaviors. The long-term financial sustainability of the insurance fund and the ability of the sector to meet population health care needs with the rapid aging that's occurring are major concerns and substantial efforts and strong leadership will be needed in the future to try to overcome these major challenges. Um, currently, there is some inertia in policy change because of the corruption campaign that has made everybody afraid to make decisions. And so there are a lot of um, big challenges in the future, uh, but there are also a greater willingness to try changes to provider payment reforms and to improve um, the efficiency of the health system. Um, some of the important changes will require political decisions that there currently is not enough pressure for those to occur. Uh, and in the future, it may require that other parts of the system fail beyond uh, losing national leadership in the health sector before some uh, changes will, will take place, such as measures to uh, stronger measures on tobacco control and reforms that will help to strengthen the primary health care system, uh, despite the strong financial interests of the hospital sector. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. I should just also mention that the other chapters in the social sector sector of the book and dealt with inequality and poverty, the evolution of the education system, uh, the nature of the Vietnamese family and its evolution and uh, policy toward, toward the family. Um, Bill, uh, the floor is yours, foreign policy. Great. Thank you very much, Dwight, and, and thanks to Boyer for uh, both of your work in pulling this together. And Thanks to everybody else who has contributed. Um, so I have written uh, what is chapter 16 in the book, um, which is one of three chapters on um, Vietnam's foreign relations. Uh, so there's another chapter by Alexander Vuving and another by Ed Miller, which is specifically on uh, Vietnam-US relations. But I was asked to write about Vietnam-China relations. And what I try to do was write an account of Vietnam-China relations over the past century that put the Communist Party at the center of the analysis, not the state, but the Communist Party itself. So you can think of it really as, I suppose, a, a political history of Vietnam's international relations, or to put it the other way around, uh, explaining international relations as in large part a function of domestic politics. Um, so it's not the fruit of uh, extensive research in the Vietnamese diplomatic archives, uh, more of a synthesis of the best writing, in my view, on, on Vietnam's foreign relations uh, over the past few years by people like Coastal Path, David Elliott, uh, Zachary Abuza, Chris Gosher, and quite a few others. Um, but it traced, you know, one chapter, I, I, I trace the uh, the political history of Vietnam's foreign relations, or relations with China specifically, um, you know, and over the course of a century. So it's a rather kind of um, cook's tour, if you like. Um, and it traces the, the history 
um, from the first contacts between what would become the Communist Parties of China and, and Vietnam at the Huangpu Military Academy uh, in southern China in the 1920s. This was where Ho Chi Minh met Zhou Enlai, for example. Um, did I do this just to kind of show the reader just how deep these connections between the two communist parties are? Um, Chris Gosher has calculated that around 200 Vietnamese nationalists were trained um, in the Chinese Military Academy in the 1920s, and that created the basis for um, not only a communist party, but a, a military machine, of course, um, and, the, and the ties and the connections, which then allowed um, uh, the DRV, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, to take power in 1945, and then with further Chinese military support to win at Dien Bien Phu in 1954, um, and then again uh, through the 1960s and 70s to the eventual victory in 1975. Um, so, of course, you know, we're all well aware of the, um, the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979 uh, and the conflict um, and the bitterness that, you know, remains in China-Vietnam relations today. But I think sometimes that obscures these deeper uh, structural party-to-party -party, uh, connections, um, which, which endure. Um, I mean, one of the most jaw-dropping, um, you know, Conclusions, I think, that Carl Coastal Path reaches um, in his um, an analysis of the 1979 Sino Vietnamese War was his argument that Vietnam deliberately triggered this war in order to oblige the Soviet Union to increase its aid uh, to uh, Vietnam, uh, to put it on the sort of uh, the front line of the Sino Soviet split, as it were. And then uh, you know, just a decade later for um, Hanoi to change direction radically again when it looked like um, the Communist Party rule was teetering in Eastern Europe, of course, um, and Vietnam switches uh, its alignment firmly towards China in 1990 um, and has remained that way pretty much um, ever since. So, you know, the history which I've just skipped over was the one in which the Communist Party was able to play off its Soviet and Chinese backers against each other in order to maintain some kind of strategic autonomy. Um, and that this was actually, in many ways, a function of domestic battles about the direction of the Communist Revolution and the war and all the rest of it. And they were able to play off their external sponsors um, to their own domestic advantage. Um, but having said that, you know, the Communist Party remains has remained close to its Chinese counterpart since 1990, of course, is not to say that everything is fine. Um, at the beginning in my sort of introduction to the chapter, I, this is what I say, I say the People's Republic of China is the Socialist Republic of Vietnam's largest neighbor, biggest trading partner and oldest diplomatic supporter. Yet the relationship between the two party states is the most fraught of all Hanoi's external ties. The Communist Party of Vietnam regards the Communist Party of China as both an ideological friend and a risk to its nationalist legitimacy. For the Vietnamese state, China is both a vital economic benefactor and an existential security threat. As a state, China is too close, too large and too assertive. But as a Leninist regime, China's ruling party is an ally against political pluralism. This contradiction between the Communist Party of Vietnam's ideological cooperation with its Chinese counterpart and its simultaneous search for domestic legitimacy is the most important dilemma in the party state's contemporary foreign relations. And so I argue that from the outset, the overwhelming priority of Vietnam's successive communist leaderships has been regime survival, the maintenance of the party's domestic power, or more specifically, the power and the worldview of the dominant fraction within the party. Their second objection, so second objective has been to assert the strategic autonomy of the, of the Vietnamese state. And since 1945, the record suggests the party leadership will always prioritize its own leading role because it believes the party represents the interests of the Vietnamese nation as a whole. And then from this, during the chapter, I argue that current and future party leaderships are going to require considerable ingenuity to overcome the increasingly contradictory imperatives of protecting strong political and economic ties with Beijing 
while also maintaining independence, resisting hostile moves, and containing growing anti-China feelings among the population. So a sort of a crude representation of that might be to see the, you know, the Communist Party sees China as a friend and the United States as an enemy, something that an entity that promotes political pluralism and, and democracy and unwelcome things like that. Whereas the Vietnamese state might regard China as an enemy in terms of uh, disputes in the South China Sea or over the flow of the Mekong River, for example, and the United States as a friend. Yet, of course, Vietnam is a one party state. So whichever sort of agenda takes priority depends on uh, the issue at hand um, and the wider um, dilemmas that the party faces. Um, but ultimately, the most important factor is um, the party's continuing leading role in Vietnamese society. Um, and I think that then sort of leads us on briefly to sort of where, since I'm talking here about sort of Vietnam's uh, foreign relations as a whole, rather than just its China relations, um, to think about the recent upgrade uh, in Vietnam-US uh, relations to the level of strategic cooperative partner, um, and um, so a comprehensive strategic partner. Um, um, but I think it's, it's very revealing, you know, this is the, the photo, the official photo of Biden's meeting with Nguyen Phu Chom, the um, uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party, but you know, look who he's meeting with. Um, you know, to his right sits the um, the head of the party's Central Organization Commission, Chung Ti Mai, and to his left, the other side of the translator, is the Minister of Public Security, To Lom. Um, and I think this is, you know, showing really at the moment where power lies uh, in Vietnam. It's very much, as we've been hearing, uh, this is the party in control. Uh, the government uh, side, which was more in the ascendant, perhaps under Prime Minister Zung, um, you know, has, has been firmly pushed back, and we're now seeing the uh, the ascendancy of the sort of the the Leninist loyalists, if you like, those who play, who put the system um, above individuals. Um, and I think you know here more clearly than I think in the last twenty years, uh, we're seeing um, you know, the rise of the party, the importance of the party in determining. Uh, the scope and scale of Vietnam's foreign relations. Um, and I think this has all been predicated, this, this uh, increase um, in the level of US-Vietnam relations has been predicated on the US-Vietnam joint vision statement, which was agreed in, in 2015. Um, and it's worth, I think, highlighting here that when Phan Ming Jing uh, went to Washington in May last year and gave a speech at the uh, think tank CSIS. More or less the first thing he said after saying thank you for coming and, and everything was to remind his American audience of that 2015 joint vision statement, which contains the phrase respect for each other's political systems, independence, sovereignty and territorial integrity. So I think from the Vietnamese side, what they have been angling for for years has been some reassurance that the US will not try to undermine Communist Party rule uh, through the promotion of democracy or religious freedom or whatever. Um, and it has been thinking about ways to give the United States a stake in uh, political stability in Vietnam. Uh, and in the cause of the South China Sea, I think it's found something. Uh, I think it's been able to offer the permanent prospect of cooperation on things like the South China Sea or uh, the US's concerns about China, uh, while never actually uh, delivering what many in the US want. Um, so I think in this, uh, Vietnam has played another masterstroke, just as it used to play off the Chinese and Soviet um, governments during the Vietnam War, it's now managing to play off uh, the US and Chinese uh, governments in its battle to maintain um, political supremacy uh, in Vietnam. Um, and I think there was a little reminder of that just shortly after Fan Ming Ching gave his um, talk at uh, CSIS in May last year when um, in an unguarded moment, uh, the Vietnamese delegation uh, was heard um, boasting how it had managed to put uh, Joe Biden into checkmate on questions of political reform um, in, uh, in, in their bilateral discussions. However, 
China uh, doesn't miss an opportunity to uh, shoot itself in the foot when it comes to relations with um, Vietnam. And it's currently uh, pursuing uh, a very aggressive uh, set of measures against Vietnam to try to prevent Vietnam developing a gas field in the South China Sea. So it's this screen here, this map shows the bottom end of the South China Sea with the southern Vietnamese coast up here in the top and uh, Borneo down here. Um, and there's a bit, and this is the Chinese U-shaped line coming down here through the very far reaches close to the Indonesian island of Natuna here. And there is this overlap here between the the U-shaped or nine-dash line that China claims and the exclusive economic zone that Indonesia claims from uh, Tuna Tuna here. And there's a very large gas field in the middle called the Tuna Block. Um, and Vietnam and Indonesia finally agreed the, their maritime boundaries, uh, an issue which had been lingering for years um, back in December. And a few days later, they announced a deal whereby this tuna block gas, which sits within the Indonesian exclusive economic zone, would be developed and pumped to um, Vietnam to generate electricity because Vietnam is suffering from electricity shortages, which are becoming a bit of a bottleneck on economic growth. Um, China's response was to send a Coast Guard ship to aggressively patrol over this area and try and intimidate the two countries from not developing it. But it seems that China has decided that Indonesia is not going to be deterred, so it's going to pressure Vietnam instead and has been stepping up uh, maritime uh, surveys and other coercive measures against Vietnam for the last few months. Um, and so it seems really that um, this uh, the reason why Vietnam has been willing to upgrade its relations with uh, the US, I think, is, is in part a warning to the Chinese sides that its behavior in the South China Sea is unacceptable. Um, and uh, it's specifically on this question of the fate of the tuna block. That's how I read it, um, uh, because that's so vital to Vietnam's uh, future economic growth. Um, my question, I suppose, really is whether this is going to have an effect. Um, is China going to think that Vietnam is serious? I mean, Vietnam, you know, I don't think has any intention of forming any kind of alliance with the United States or, you know, its famous four no's about uh, not involving other countries in, it, in its struggles or becoming involved in other countries' struggles. Um, so is China actually going to take this upgrade seriously and, and back off? Or is it going to be, uh, you know, kind of dead set on this on this road of confrontation? I think if it does that, it's going to end up losing possibly its uh, most friendly uh, pro-China regime that it's had for at least 20 years uh, in China. Um, as Mr. Chom balances Vietnam's uh, external relations uh, with his own domestic priorities. But I'll leave it there um, and then we can pick up more in the Q&A. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I just mentioned this is our sample of four of our uh, authors of the book. Uh, of the 23 authors, eight or from v are from Vietnam, eight are from North America, and seven are from Europe. It was not planned that way. It just happened when we got the people we most wanted. That was the that was the breakdown. Uh, Frederick Logoval, the floor is yours. Well, uh, honored to be with you all this uh, today and to have a chance to offer a few remarks on on this great occasion. I'm looking at the clock and uh, very conscious of the fact that I'm the only thing standing between you all and some some discussion. So what I think I'm going to do is is uh, truncate uh, my planned remarks uh, and maybe just highlight a few things. I'll I'll, I'll speak um, I'll speak briefly. Let me come right to the point, however, ladies and gentlemen, and say that this is a remarkable book in my view. I think we all know that edited volumes are often a mixed bag in every sense of that phrase, sometimes very mixed. But I think this one is truly excellent from top to bottom. Um, it also, as Bodia, Bodia pointed out this morning, today, uh, it's one with the, and we've just heard from Bill, there is great contemporary resonance, it seems to me, in what this book uh, achieves. So if you have not had a chance excuse me, a chance to, to read the book yet, you should run, not walk, run to get a copy of this book. 
a, a terrific roster of, um, I guess, about 22 authors, not including the editors, representing various disciplines, as we've heard, various backgrounds, different countries. Pardon me. Different backgrounds. It's a book that is at once uh, authoritative and, uh, how should I put this, accessible to a non-specialist reader. That's a difficult thing to pull off, and yet I think it does. Um, and I, it seems to me that fundamentally what the book is attempting to do is to come to grips with something that on some level seems maybe um, impossible, reconcile something that seems irreconcilable. Um, how do you maintain a one-party system and a market-based economy in a global supply chain? Um, and so, again, it's just, it seems to me, um, a, a marvelous uh, volume. And it's a success story, it seems to me. Um, not, one, not one of unbounded success, but a success story. And you put down the book after finishing it, or at least I did, with an understanding of the challenges that Vietnam is likely to face in the coming years and decades as it works to become a high-income country. And you sense maybe in particular that the first section, well, no, this, this runs throughout the volume, that institutional politics and reforms, uh, political reforms, will be of utmost importance going forward. What I had intended to do was to highlight here a few chapters that I thought were especially um, notable. Um, but I've decided, again, in the interest of time, that I won't. I'll just mention that Bodhya <clears throat> Jungrian's opening chapter uh, on the party state, as he calls it, which he has defined for us today, is a marvelous opening chapter for the volume. <clears throat> I want to note also that I learned a great deal from, from Trom and McPherson on the en environmental effects um, and the costs. Uh, the, 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 the gains have been real, they show, but the costs have been immense. And I really learned so much here with respect to coastal erosion, land degradation, pollution, and, and the overuse of agro, agro, um, agro uh, chemicals and what the implications are. Just a marvelous chapter. Section three, uniformly excellent again. Um, the chapter on education by Jonathan London, uh, I commend to you all, uh, was mentioned, I think, briefly by somebody today, and especially the needs in secondary and post-secondary education uh, going forward. Vietnam does not have enough universities, needs to get stronger um, as it wants to move up the technology ladder, that chapter shows. Um, I think very effectively. And then in, in the last section of the book, which Bill Hayden has just, in a sense, uh, summarized for us, um, really important questions raised about Vietnam's foreign relations in three superb chapters. And I think as the editors note in their, uh, in their introduction, you could have, of course, had several more chapters on foreign relations. You could have had a chapter on Russia, really important a uh, bilateral relationship, chapter on the EU, on ASEAN, on relations with other countries in the region. It's a, it's a separate book. In fact, maybe there is an idea um, to produce another volume that is focused on Vietnam's um, foreign relations, if you will. But these three chapters, it seems to me, work really well to conclude um, the volume. And Bill has just laid out it seems to me seems to me many of the core questions by the way i commend to, uh, recommend to you um his recent book a brief history of vietnam uh, which i think came out last year bill if i remember and um alongside chris gosha's history of the country in the english language it seems to me are two excellent contemporary um recent histories of the country so if for those of you who might be interested in that. Um, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to conclude with a few questions and then turn it back over to you, Dwight, for some, for some Q&A. 
What does it mean that Vietnam's economic moment seems to have arrived? Fastest growing economy in Asia last year. I think it, I think there was an 8% growth last year. Foreign, divest, foreign direct investment, as I think Boya mentioned at the, at the outset, um, soared in 2022. Um, big names like Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Dell have shifted parts of their supply chain to Vietnam in recent years. Um, and so clearly companies have grasped this opportunity to diversify their supply chain, partly because of rising labor costs uh, and political risks erode China's relative advantage. What does that mean? Really interesting. US share of imports from Vietnam has risen about two percentage points since US-China trade rate relations began to, to, to flare in, in uh, to, to rise in 2018. Um, and as I think Boria or maybe Dwight at the outset opened, um, rapid reduction um, in poverty levels in recent decades with hugely important implications. Um, one question I have, and others can speak to this with more authority than I can. Is there a risk for Vietnam that like Malaysia and Thailand in the late 1990s, Vietnam could succumb to the so-called middle income trap? Countries are unable to transform from a low cost to a high value economy, making it difficult to compete with both low and high income countries. To, to what degree is that a danger? Um, will leaders in Hanoi implement the institutional political reforms that Boria and Dwight in their, induction, in, in their introduction deem imperative? Um, Boria mentioned today that Vietnam must move beyond the party state. Uh, I think Bill also in his comments today um, said this. Will that happen? What are the prospects for that happening? Bill referred to Vietnam playing off China and the United States against each other for its own advantage. To what extent can that um, uh, ambition, that policy succeed? Um, so those are my, some of my questions. In their introduction, uh, Boria and Dwight say this. They write, despite the many challenges, some of which are clearly uh, are highly systemic, we remain optimistic about Vietnam's future, unquote. Um, it shall be interesting to see if they are correct in that judgment. Thank you, Dwight. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, Tony, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but have, have you picked a few questions? Well, I I'll have really questions. we could try to answer Frederick's questions, but I have more questions than we can actually get to in the remaining time. However, what I'd like to do, Dwight, is bring you into the conversation uh, with one of the questions, and it relates to some of the issues that were raised, and it piggybacks on uh, one of Fred's questions there, and that is to what extent uh, can Vietnam replace China? in terms of the global supply chain? It's something we keep hearing about. How realistic is it in your view, Dwight? Uh, I think it's, you know, you know, it's clearly possible for some companies and probably uh, relative to Vietnam's economy can uh, considerable uh, effect on Vietnam uh, to shift. But the notion of totally replacing China, I mean, after all, one of the major motives lots of companies go into China is its domestic market as well as, well as its uh, a very efficient supply chain. The supply chain structure in, in Vietnam is nowhere near uh, up to the quality of China. Uh, whether it, it could really replace China uh, more broadly, it gets into issues of, of uh, the university level education. Uh, the, that, that is, is still very, very weak, uh, you know, pretty good at the secondary and primary levels. Uh, 
there are a whole range of issues. Uh, and then there's the question of what exactly the role of the party is. Uh, China today has a problem that uh, the party is getting more and more involved and, 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 and probably doing a good deal of damage to the economy. In some ways, Vietnam is, uh, has never moved out of uh, as the private sector in China was a substantially more vital, vital than the Vietnamese private sector. Uh, as the state enterprises have continued to play a much more dominant role. I mean, Swan Tang talked about this a bit, but um, I think they have to move away from that much more if they're going to be uh, uh, to really substitute for China. But just the simple size uh, it makes it. China, Vietnam can benefit enormously, but uh, from the shift, but and it'll help offset some of the other things that Vietnam, Vietnamese politics in the wrong direction. So Great. I'll leave yeah. it at that. Yeah, from what I've seen, actually, a lot of what is going into uh, relocated enterprises in Vietnam, the materials are coming down from China in any case. I that's think, I think that's it's true, too, yeah. It leads me to a couple of questions following on to that that are combined for Bill, if I may. And I think you, you dug into this and maybe a little bit deeper. And it's really a question of whether Vietnam can be a re reliable ally for the US. I know they don't use the word ally. And I suppose it was sparked in people's attention by the New York Times piece that accompanied President Biden's visit when he talked about this arm purchases from uh, Russia. And maybe you could talk a little bit about the relationship to Russia as it is important. And you didn't have time to cover that so much in your comments. Yeah, I mean, I think the simple answer is uh, no. <laughs> Vietnam is not going to be a reliable ally of the United States. Uh, the, the Communist Party is going to be a reliable ally of itself. Uh, and to the extent that it can use uh, the US to do that, then it will. Um, and I think part of this is sort of, uh, it's almost um, metaphysical. You know, who, do you, who does Vietnam trust? Who does the Communist Party trust? And it trusts Russia. I'm afraid it still doesn't trust the United States because it thinks of the United States as an evangelical power, which has a mission to spread democracy and, and pluralism and all the rest of it. Um, uh, no matter how much I think, you know, Anthony Blinken goes to Hanoi, he'll never successfully uh, convince his Vietnamese counterparts of that. But that doesn't mean that, you know, Vietnam is stuck in a camp um, and won't, you know, seek to you know, work with others to its, its advantage. And clearly, uh, you know, it needs to find whatever it is, 800,000 new jobs a year for the 18 year olds entering the workforce. And so it needs Boeing, um, it needs Microsoft, it needs everybody else to come and invest and, and, and go upscale. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think the US, uh, you know, should delude itself that um, Vietnam is going to join, you know, some kind of naval expedition uh, in the South China Sea with the US. Um, but clearly they have you know, interests that, that um, coincide and, and, and overlap. Um, uh, and when it comes to big strategic weapons like jet fighters and you know, submarines and things, uh, you know, Indonesia, well, the Indonesian example you know, from a few years ago when the US cut off spare part supplies to Indonesia's F-16s, I mean, that, you know, that was <laughs> a very clear warning to a country like Vietnam not to become dependent on, on the US. Um, whereas it can trust Russia to keep supplying weapons regardless of anything that happens, I think, internally, um, obviously subject to uh, actually having an arms industry that can um, that, that, that uh, has sufficient spare capacity. But you see Vietnam trying to diversify, you know, going towards Israel uh, in some places, going to other, other providers. But um, it seems that when it comes to uh, purchase from the US, it'll probably focus on sort of rather niche things, I think, rather than um, you know, the, the big ticket items. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if there was an earlier warning, it was with India, that when the US cut off sales there, they mm -hmm. moved to Russia. And now, of course, they're trying to re-engineer that uh, with considerable uh, problems. Uh, Shantan, if, if you're there, if I could just pick up on uh, one point that uh, Bill made, that's the need for uh, uh, generating sufficient employment. 
And uh, you talked about the oligarchs, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about what are the best ways for Vietnam to develop the private sector? Because presumably that is where most job opportunities are going to be available. Yes. So, uh, so, so far Vietnam has been very successful in attracting labor intensive uh, uh, FDIs and also domestic investments. So the main job generation uh, activities are uh, footwear and garments, but they are slowing down because of rising cost. Right. So, uh, so now with the upgrade of U.S. Vietnam relation uh, to strategic and comprehensive partnership, I think one of the economic reasons that Vietnam finally agreed to the relationship upgrade, right after many years uh, of lobbying from from the U.S. side, was the official designation Vietnam as a friendly destination. So part of the French shore strategy. So the hope is that Vietnam will, will see a, a wave of uh, electronic and in particular semiconductor investments uh, in Vietnam as part of the shift in the supply chains. But uh, the, the, the semiconductor investment will not be as labor intensive as the traditional export oriented manufacturing, a lot of automation uh, will happen. So the challenge now is whether Vietnam can produce semi-skilled and, um, and skilled uh, workers to take the full advantage of, of these uh, uh, new uh, industries. Um, in, in Vietnam. So, so, so uh, at, at least for, for now, I, I, I think uh, uh, the, the most recent investments uh, are often accompanied not only by simple manufacturing, but also uh, setting up of uh, research centers. So Samsung, Intel, uh, all announced new investments with also uh, the setup of, of, of research centers in, in Hanoi and in, in, uh, uh, in Ho Chi Minh. But as, uh, I mean, the chapter on, on ed education show Vietnam has a long way ahead of, of strengthening its higher education system. Great, thanks. Uh, Boye, we have a chance to question you on Wednesday, <laughs> tomorrow at the Brown Bag. So I'd like to address what I think will be the last question to Sarah. Uh, and uh, we all sort of think and know of Vietnam as a young country, but one of the questions that came up was about where the, what is the future of organized institutional long-term care for the aged in Vietnam? Are they preparing? Are they looking ahead to that? How do you see that developing? Yeah, that's a very good question. Question: Vietnam has um, one of the most rapidly aging countries in in Asia. Um, the expected share of population in older ages will be very large, and the number of people able to support them will be relatively small uh, by 2050. Um, Vietnam has awareness of the problem, but so far I haven't seen many measures in place to help develop institutional. Um, programs for long-term care. There's no discussion of any kind of long-term care insurance. Uh, what's in place now is uh, uh, programs at the community level, um, self-help clubs for older people that rely on more community solidarity. Um, there's um, really very little from the government on long-term care, and that's really only for the poorest people um, or the people who are um, war invalids who have uh, issues of, of mental health. There's some government programs, but it's really minimal. Um, there is some private sector investment in, in um, um, nursing homes, but it's really only for the wealthy. So it's still, so far, it's very focused on family care. Great, thanks. Um, I hand it back to you, Dwight. 
Well, I think we've reached the bewitching hour of 9.30. So thank you all. Thank all the audience, the 80 plus that stuck through the whole affair. Um, um, I think it's been an excellent discussion and and I hope the book, I uh, hope the, those of you who read the book will find it equally stimulating. So thank you very much. Thank you.